So thanks, Peter, for, for, for joining us, for making this possible, and uh, congratulations for publishing this book. And uh, I mean, this is already a way of, of introducing you. Um, I guess you could write it, uh, because early on, um, you wrote timely books about other epidemics. And, don't you know, take too much away from me. It's <laughs> yep. And uh, okay, so I will stop here and just say thank you for joining us. And I'm looking forward uh, to an interesting evening. All of us do that. Welcome to everybody who's listening. Professor Baldwin, Peter Waldwin is professor of history at UCLA and NYU. Um, he uh, was educated in Harvard and Yale, founded Arcadia, is called Philanthrop, donated millions to good causes to charities. And now he is here to talk to us um, about his latest book, Fighting the First Wave, uh, why the coronavirus was tackled so differently across the globe. And um, the other books that you wrote, actually, we're probably going to talk about them later on because they obviously have to do a lot with pandemics and uh, that this coronavirus, because you, you did write about the politics of social solidarity, which is, you know, is, it has to do with that contagion and state in Europe, 1830 to 1930. So you're a specialist. And uh, now you're a specialist on the most recent pandemic and we're happy to listen to you. Thank you very much. Um, the book, uh, you know, is already out of date. Uh, and now I wish, of course, um, I could publish it again with a few more chapters. But uh, I thought that I would take this occasion since the theme here is transitions to talk about the kinds of changes that the pandemic is likely to have uh, introduced and, and some that it's unlikely to introduce. So we're clearly living through the worst public health crisis, at least of a century. Uh, there are millions of deaths, there are trillions in economic damage, hospital systems have been overwhelmed, government administrations have been swamped, economies around the world have been becalmed. Surely you would think this is going to have an effect, it's going to leave traces, it's going to change things. But if you think back to the last time we faced something similar, the Spanish flu, which was of course many times worse, 50 million deaths rather than 3 million deaths so far, we hope it's many times worse, um, you'll realize that perhaps, you know, the effect isn't going to be so big. Many of us had barely heard of the Spanish flu when the COVID pandemic broke out. Probably had it not been for COVID, we would have remained largely ignorant. And that's even though the Spanish flu had a mortality that was many times that of the entire First World War. So the question is sort of, is there something about epidemics that make them less potent makers of change than wars? Their demographic effects can be presumably comparable. If they kill sufficiently many, there may be labor shortages. It could be possible wage increases. Wars tend to kill young men most immediately. The Spanish flu killed the young. COVID preferentially started at least killing the old, so that makes it economically less impactful than the Spanish flu. And wars, uh, of course, have other effects than pandemics, uh, um, and uh, effects that pandemics don't. They devastate infrastructure, they rev up production of certain goods, decrease production of other goods, they have geopolitical consequences, they change borders, they spark revolutions, they cause regimes to fall and nations to disappear. Pandemics, you know, not so much. Trump probably lost the election thanks to his mishandling of the public health response. New Zealand's prime minister was probably re-elected thanks to her deft handling of it. Bolsonaro, on the other hand, uh, remains in power. You know, on the whole, after pandemics, we tend to pick ourselves up and carry on, much as before. And the question is, is that going to be the case this time as well? Or are there changes that the COVID pandemic will prompt? Now, the press, for anyone who's been following this, has been full of suggestions of changes that are going to occur. And some of these are things that have already long been taking place. They may have been accelerated by the pandemic, but it'd be hard to say that they were caused by it. So working from home, of course, had already been widely practiced before. Many companies already had a one day a week policy in place when it struck, and they merely ramped that up. And it's possible, I suppose, they'll do two days a week instead. Online shopping, much the same. It was already here. It was given a boost. It's likely that it's going to remain at a higher level than would have been true without the pandemic. And of course, the same goes for online education. That had already broken over us with the MOOCs and other online courses. And the pandemic, in a sense, really made a necessity of a virtue, 
will no doubt have more of that, but there'll also be a massive return, I would think, to uh, in-person instruction. And probably in the long run, for primary and secondary education, there are hardly gonna be any changes at all. Now, what we're doing here, having this talk, conference, whatever you want to call it on Zoom, is of course one of the silver linings of the pandemic. Zoom and its equivalents existed before that, but we academics, unlike the business people to a greater extent, we academics were too stuck in our ways to use them. Now that we've been forced to do so, I don't think there's really any turning back. Obviously everybody hates and gripes about Zoom lectures, conferences, seminars, tutorials, and obviously, um, I'd much rather be sort of going out to dinner and drinks with some of you afterwards uh, than, than not, uh, not to mention the time difference. Um, that's obviously sad, but the upsides of this sort of thing are so big that I don't think we're ever really gonna have exclusively in-person conferences or talks again. The ability to transcend space and time has multiplied our audiences dramatically and it's radically democratized access. And I don't think we're gonna give that up again. Travel is another thing that's likely going to change and diminish, at least in the first world. But globally seen, it seems to me that the pending growth in travel was so massive. And those who stood poised to come into the system for the first time in the developing nations are so many that there may be a slowing of the upward trajectory, but it's hardly going to reverse. Certain economic sectors were hit harder by the pandemic than others. Hospitality and tourism, of course, above all, will come out of this ravaged and diminished. But you know, they don't make up that big a part of most economies. Uh, in the OECD, I think Italy tops the league at 13%, but it's only 4% of the US by comparison. And most economic sectors carried on surprisingly undiminished. Some of them uh, positively prospered, publishing online retail, for example. Nor do I think that the, ec the ecological effects of the lockdowns are going to show the way to any kind of a new green equilibrium. The UN calculated that to keep temperature increases below one and a half degrees uh, Celsius, we would need to slow CO2 emissions or, or have them start falling by almost 8% annually. And during the pandemic, even with air travel largely frozen and lockdowns keeping people in place, that was about the reduction that we achieved in this past year. That gives us a sobering indication of just how much our habits would have to change if we expect to solve global warming merely by adjusting them. Even if we all go Greta Thunberg and never set foot in an airplane, it's simply not gonna solve the problem. The pandemic also reinforced a trend towards more economic nationalism that had started long before. Global supply chains and just-in-time delivery are of course wonderfully efficient, but in the pandemic, our emergency supplies turned out to be in effect a clutch of contracts with suppliers, most of whom were based in China. No one had imagined that the entire world would go into lockdown and shut borders at the same time. Excuse me. So how should we react to that kind of problem? Well, personal protective equipment, PPE, that was such a big deal in the beginning of the, of the pandemic is not rocket science, of course, and clearly stockpiles need more attention, but this stuff is also perishable, which means that we have to throw it away and replenish it regularly, which is something that costs money as well. And who knows what the next pandemic is going to demand. This time it was ventilators. Now we have lots of ventilators. That may not always be what's needed. On the whole, it's not good to be entirely dependent on a few suppliers, and it is good to diversify the supply chains. But that's not the same as saying that it's also good to bring more production back home than you can actually efficiently handle. Economically, economic nationalism is inefficient and it costs money that can be better spent elsewhere. Now, so far, I've just been touching on a few changes that were brought about by COVID and uh, that will not be very big or significant. Um, and I've talked about a few changes yeah, no. that, um, uh, that, that have taken place, but that really were at most accelerated, but not created by the pandemic. And so the question remains, you know, are, are there not bigger changes uh, involved as well? And here, the question of economic intervention uh, looms large. Is the state going to expand its economic role? And it seems to me the answer is not everywhere. In this case too, nations responded quite differently. Some, some nations had a bigger task to face. In Asia, where few lockdowns were imposed, 
Those nations carried on more normally than the Western democracies. It had to keep businesses and workers afloat. And as a result, the economic stimulus package that followed the first wave cost them a great deal less. As a fraction of GDP, China's stimulus program uh, cost less than half as much as the American. Now, what this suggests is that public health success has actually left the economic status quo more in place in those nations uh, whose public health response was weaker. In other words, the better you were at the public health response, the less you had to worry about the economic response. But the Western democracies at lockdown, of course, faced huge tasks in keeping the ship afloat, spending to keep workers fed, businesses solvent, and the economy from shrinking more than necessary, that kind of spending has been enormous. And interestingly here, the US has spent more in this respect than Europe, and it stands poised now to reap the economic benefits from a highly stimulated and arguably overstimulated economy. So as an economic intervener, the state has expanded and it's doubtless going to remain larger than otherwise in the near future. What then about the state as a regulator and as a policymaker? One lesson has been that in a pandemic that is expanding exponentially, infections double if you wait a week. That was the tragedy in the UK last spring that it had a leader who was temperamentally incapable of taking decisions except at the last minute. And British deaths were many times higher than they had to have been had decisions been taken more quickly. The same holds largely for the US and for most other Western democracies. Now that makes it sound as though the autocracies would have inevitably fared better in fighting this sort of enemy, since they could take decisive action quickly, ruthlessly and thoroughly. And in the case of China, that's more or less the case. But of course, there were other nations that handled things even better that were not autocracies, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, South Korea. So democracies can do this too. And of course, it helps if you're an island like these nations, and if you can control access from the sources of an infection more easily than elsewhere. And not every autocracy did well either. Russia, we now know, has merely cooked the books on its statistics. And if you look at the excess mortality compared to the previous year, it turns out that it has been among the worst hit of nations. Nor did Iran or Venezuela or Nicaragua fare very well. Still, the point it seems to me remains that quick and consistent action has had the most dramatic effects on thwarting the spread of the pandemic. Here's another way of putting the same idea. Those nations that followed a kind of precautionary principle seem also to have done best in their public health campaigns. Clamping down quickly, ending travel, quarantining the ill and infected, testing and tracking citizens, locking down infected areas, and eventually locking down the entire nation. These were the sorts of tactics that if you impose them at once and if you maintain them consistently and durably had the greatest effect. They assumed the worst and they acted accordingly. So can we say that nations which took the most precautionary approach fared the best? It seems that way for the public health aspect of the pandemic. But the public health aspect was only one aspect of how nations reacted to the pandemic. And indeed the public health aspect could never have been more than a holding pattern as we waited for a medical solution. The other aspect of the response was precisely that, throwing medical technology into the fray. And in this respect, the best actors have been a quite different array of nations. The successful public health responders and the successful medical responders are quite separate actors, with China as the one exception. And even here, it's unclear since we don't really know very much about the Chinese vaccine. The two nations that unexpectedly did most poorly in the public health response, the UK and the US, have done quite well in developing vaccines and in administering them. Those nations that were successful in public health terms aren't even players in this game. China and Russia are the new actors here for the first time in a biomedical sense. They want to be taken seriously in this respect, but they've fumbled things rather poorly. They haven't adhered to testing protocols and their vaccines are therefore less credible than they could have been. And oddly enough, they're using their vaccines to score geopolitical points rather than vaccinate their own populations. Russia is selling its in India and parts of Eastern Europe, China is selling it in Africa. That's of course great for the third world, but it leaves us to wonder about the Russians and the Chinese themselves. And in the same way, the nations that were successful in public health terms are also more generally being vaccine laggards when you look at the rollout of the vaccine. 
The Chinese are doing best in this group, but the other nations that handled public health very well are faring worse. It's almost as though their success in one aspect has removed the initiative to finish the job and to achieve herd immunity. Israel, as we all know, is leading the world in per capita vaccinations, 115 doses out of 100 people. This is doses per head, not, not fully vaccinated people. The US and the UK are in the 50s um, dose-wise. Most of Europe at the moment is in the 20s. The public health victors, however, are strikingly vaccine laggards. Australia is four, South Korea and New Zealand are about two, Bar Japan has barely managed more than one. They're all down there with countries where one understands why they haven't managed more like Ghana and Eswatini and Bangladesh and the like. Now, obviously this is gonna change quickly over the coming months, but it highlights how success in one aspect of policy does not translate into others. And indeed, for some of these otherwise well-functioning nations with very low vaccine scores at the moment, it seems to me we have to consider this a policy choice, not just sort of an accident. And if that's so, we need to ask what policy is it that persuades a nation that has tamed the pandemic through public health measures so that it then sits back and decides not to exit it altogether via vaccines and herd immunity. Now that takes us back to the precautionary principle and the various styles of intervention that nations have used against the pandemic. In public health terms, the precautionary principle may in fact spur the most activity, quick and decisive lockdowns, travel bans, and that sort of thing. But in terms of developing a vaccine and then getting it into people's arms, what does the precautionary principle dictate? If the goal is to minimize the risk of illness, then we may have to run other sorts of risks. How does one then square one sort of a risk against other sorts of risks? Is it still precautionary to run certain risks in hope of mitigating others? The precautionary principle is clear about avoiding risk, but it's less clear about how to balance risks against each other. Vaccine development is clearly a very risky business. As a species, we have been very lucky in getting many working results of vaccines this time, but several companies failed even though they invested heavily. Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline and Merck would all have been big players had they in fact bet on the right scientific horse. Not all vaccine developers took government funding. Moderna and AstraZeneca took money for research and development. Pfizer took it only for advanced purchases. In other words, it got paid only when it delivered. But either way, vast amounts of government money were spread among a wide variety of vaccine developers. Did the governments who paid these monies get value for money? Who cares? Compared to the trillion dollar losses of keeping the economy shut, vaccines were really just a rounding error. Would we not all willingly have spent several times the actual cost for vaccines just to get them? Israel, after all, paid 40% premium to Pfizer to get the stocks that it needed. That seems like money very well spent. So what does the precautionary principle say about vaccine development? It seems to me it's unclear. Does it mean making painstakingly sure that it works and that it has no side effects? Does it mean worrying about whether big pharma makes too much money off the vaccines? One could, it seems to me, just as well argue that the precautionary principle applied to the correct risk, that is to say the risk of infection, would have dictated throwing everything into the search for a vaccine and then everything into getting that vaccine out into people's arms. And in this sense, the EU seems to have applied the wrong principles in dealing with vaccines. It worried about cost, when effectiveness and then quantity was really all that mattered. Could one say that the EU was trying to mitigate the wrong risks and that in the process, it lost sight of the important risk? Vaccine trials were speeded up and they were done more rapidly than in the past. That is one of the issues that we now face in trying to convince the vaccine hesitant that no meaningful corners have been cut. But of course, we could have done even more. We could have taken even more risks and brought forth the end of the pandemic. We could have used human challenge trials where volunteers are deliberately infected so that you can determine efficacy more quickly than just waiting for the natural course of infection. And the same sorts of questions about the precautionary principle have to be asked also about the rollout. Once they had a vaccine, the EU took longer than necessary to approve it. The Brits approved 
the first vaccine December 2nd. The EU did so only three weeks later, December 21st. And that was after they had realized how bad it looked to wait until people started to go very well. Uh, sorry, I've managed to get myself confused here. Um, what I'm trying to say is the EU did so three weeks later than the Brits, um, and they moved up the date uh, from the when it would have been uh, in January. But even that three week delay, um, that was a, a period of time when some 70,000 people died uh, in Europe. So the question is, you know, was that a precautionary decision or not? On the other hand, the EU has so far uh, approved four different vaccines, which is more than any other region in the world. Again, precautionary uh, or not. And think about the other risks that could have been, and in some places were in fact taken. The Brits decided to give more people a first dose even if that meant postponing the second dose, the United States ruled out taking that risk. From a societal point of view, this was prudent because it decreased the overall speed of spread. From an individual point of view, it was not prudent because it increased each person's likelihood of being infected. From a societal point of view, again, it was risky because it increased the possibility of variants, but conversely, so did a slower rollout if you had given two doses to each person. So which, decision here would be following the precautionary principle. What about mixing and matching vaccines? If for some reason you had more of one than the other, the British again made that official policy in December. The Chinese are currently discussing it. Again, the United States ruled out taking that risk because we don't know what the uh, medical effects are. Who's taking the precautionary decision here? It seems to me it's unclear. Of course, if the authorities are too risk happy, if they take too many chances, they court the danger of undermining the final goal. If you're looking at risk happiness, China and Russia, of course, were the most hardy risk takers. They approved their vaccines even earlier than the UK, but they did so without a final round of testing. Taking too many risks probably backfired in the Russian case because the Russians are now wholly unwilling to take their own vaccines. We now have the problem with blood clots in the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And here we're weighing two sets of risks against each other, deaths from coronavirus and deaths from clots. The figures are being run according to the age and the place of the vaccinated. So that if you're young enough and you live in a country with less than a certain infection rate, it may in fact not make sense to take an AstraZeneca or a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But on the other hand, if stopping use of some vaccines spurs hesitancy overall, then the total number of deaths from one cause or another is likely to be higher than had the public health administrators just plowed ahead giving shots. And of course, in the back of every policymaker's mind lies cautionary examples of being too proactive and plunging ahead. The non-existent swine flu epidemic of 1976 is an obvious case in point. A huge vaccination campaign was rolled out in the US, millions were given doses, and the outcome was that more people died of directly vaccine-related problems than of the swine flu itself. Well, the question we have is why are some nations, why have some nations excelled in the public health response, and why have other nations responded, uh, excelled in the, in the medical response? Why were some nations especially interested in a medical or a technical solution? And is it a coincidence that it was those nations that had made a hash of the public health response? Well, it helps to have a sense of which nations did well and which did poorly in the public health response. There were two kinds of nations that did well in the public health response. First, those that had the state powers needed to command their citizens to do what was necessary. And the best example here, of course, is China. But as we've seen, being an autocracy was not enough to guarantee a good outcome. And the other group that did well in public health terms were those who could count on the necessary compliance among their citizens to follow directives. New Zealand's prime minister talked about her team of 5 million people, but not every leader could do that. A similar willingness to comply was found in Taiwan, Korea, and Australia. Nations with a high degree of trust in their citizens and of citizens' trust in their governments did well in this respect. These are what social psychologists call tight societies where citizens do what is expected of them. 
So the most successful nations from a public health point of view were those either with the administrative muscle and the ability to use it, or those with a cultural and political consensus that rallied the troops, or of course, some combination of the two. So a nation like Taiwan, that is culturally and ethnically homogenous, still didn't assume in the way that the Swedes did, that its citizens would do voluntarily what they needed to. The Taiwanese kept plenty of sticks in reserve. They had mandated quarantines, they had eye-watering fines, and they used them. Conversely, those nations that did worst were ethnically, politically, socially, religiously, and in other ways, fragmented. In other words, they were most of the multicultural Western democracies, the loose societies. Some were obviously worse than others. Bolsonaro's Brazil was an extreme example. Here was a leader who simply thought that he could not demand of his poorest citizens the economic sacrifices that lockdown would bring. And of course, there were similar aspects to Trump's refusal to encourage a uniform lockdown across the US. But something similar held broadly across the Western democracies as a group. The conflicts over what sorts of public health interventions were permissible were so fraught that in effect, many could not be usefully implemented. Contact tracing apps, for example, were gutted in the Western democracies. In these countries, they were largely rendered useless by the insistence of privacy advocates that they not be allowed to register location, but measure only proximity. And then in any case, all reporting was to be done voluntarily. And in practice that effectively eliminated what could have been a very useful tool. It was also in the Western democracies that people insisted that the requirement of wearing masks in public was some sort of violation of civil rights. No shirts, no shoes, no service. This is a sign that one often sees in American restaurants. In Europe, it's too obvious and taken for granted to even require a sign. But the same people who don't think twice about these sorts of requirements, of course, bristled at being asked to wear a mask. So why did those nations that were least good at getting their citizens to follow the rules pursue the exit strategy of a vaccine most fervently? It seems to me that the answer is that technology trumps politics. A technical fix was by far the easiest way of sidestepping the insolvable political dilemmas that were thrown up by a pandemic. Pandemics are zero sum political quandaries. You have to force certain citizens to bear the brunt of protective measures so that other citizens don't need to knuckle under. The Chinese locked down Hubei province so that the rest of China was spared. Taiwan locked incoming travelers into the quarantine to spare those who were at home. You know, Australia refused to allow even its own citizens back into the country and citizens in Korea and Taiwan were under surveillance that was inconceivable in Western nations and so forth. These were the sorts of tactics that the Western democracies decided they were unable to impose. And as a result, they ended up with broad lockdowns that imposed lesser restrictions across the board rather than harsh but circumscribed restrictions where they counted the most. They were therefore also the nations with the most pressing motives to find an exit solution as soon as possible. Now, this is not the first time we've seen this logic at work. In fact, this is the logic that has long been behind America's approach to public health. You try to find a technical solution to what would otherwise be a political dilemma. And we saw this the last time in the AIDS epidemic. AIDS could be tackled by imposing behavioral restrictions on those who were ill and those who were likely to infect others. But victims of HIV in the industrialized world were largely members of oppressed sexual and ethnic minorities. This made clamping down on them with traditional tactics of contagious disease control, something that was politically ticklish. Imposing isolation, imposing quarantine, testing, or mandating abstinence on these sorts of groups was an unappealing prospect for most policymakers. There were only a few nations in the world that tried to do that. North Korea, Sweden, Bavaria, Cuba, and a few American states. Elsewhere, AIDS was tackled with voluntarist measures. The infected and their sexual partners were counseled on how to minimize transmission, but otherwise they were left alone in hopes of deflecting the stigma of the disease. The only palatable, the only politically palatable way out of the HIV dilemma was medical. And in the intervening years, we have gradually achieved that solution after billions of dollars of biomedical spending over 40 years, 
the lion's share of which has been financed by the US. The latest HIV drugs have turned AIDS into another of modernity's chronic diseases. They've made it something whose symptoms can be managed throughout a lifetime and no longer a death sentence. And it seems to me that much the same logic was at work in the COVID pandemic, except that this time we were very, very lucky to get an immune response and therefore a vaccine. Indeed, we got one almost instantly. The bulk of the biomedical financing and research has come from the US. The US program to pay for R&D and to pre-order doses had cost them $18 billion by October. By contrast, the EU with a larger population had committed uh, something like $4 billion uh, or euro uh, by September. Having bungled the public health response, countries like the US and the UK were very keen on a medically based solution. It was perhaps the one thing that Trump got right about his COVID policies, but it was huge. Meanwhile, the best public health performers have contributed very little to a biomedical exit from the pandemic. We see this trade-off between technology and politics most clearly in this case in Israel. Israel has shown the rest of the world how to do this. You pay a 40% premium to Pfizer to get the necessary supplies, and then you unleash a centralized and efficient healthcare apparatus to do its magic. Why has Israel been so eager to get vaccination right? It seems to me that the answer is that a technological fix allows its leaders to sidestep an unwelcome and now unnecessary confrontation with the ultra-Orthodox and their habits, which are pretty hard to contain within lockdown. The ultra-Orthodox make up 12% of the population. At the peak of the second wave, they were 60% of the cases in major hospitals. That brings us finally back to the question of citizen compliance with the dictates of public health and what the experience of COVID tells us about how nations may seek to tackle these sorts of problems in the future. Democracies have not been very good actors. The less consensual, the less trust their citizens had in their authorities, the looser these societies were, the more that's true. There are basic issues about democracies about, that explain why they're not good at this sort of thing. Taking decisions promptly, indeed immediately, is crucial in exponentially growing pandemic circumstances. Waiting a week means doubling the infection rate. Having to get public opinion on board, having to build consensus, having to make sure you have most citizens in agreement, all that kind of good stuff is just not feasible. Public health relies heavily on emergency legislation. And of course, the dirty little secret of democracy is in an emergency, you have to set democracy aside in order to save it. So democracies stumble already at the starting gate. If they then go on and spend a lot of political capital and energy worrying about civil rights and how they're violated by emergency regulations, then that's another own goal. But there's a broader issue here too. To what extent can authorities who need to impose sacrifices count on compliance or a willingness among citizens to do what is required without being forced to? Certain kinds of public health measures can be compelled. You can take foreign travel and shut it down or at least regulate it heavily. There are obviously some topographical elements here. It's harder to do that in the Netherlands than it is in Iceland, but it can be done unilaterally by the authorities. But other sorts of behaviors are much more difficult to pass a regulation or law about and hope for compliance unless you're willing to put a policeman behind every citizen. And since the police, of course, are citizens too, ultimately, you know, that's impossible. So requiring social distancing, for example, can just about be enforced in public, but it's much harder to enforce in private. Getting people to wear masks is tricky to enforce and is much better accomplished when everybody buys into the logic and complies voluntarily. Vaccination can be mandated and there are certain needles eyes that citizens pass through when it can be made a requirement like school enrollments or certain documentation events, getting a driver's license or a passport and the like. Now on the whole, looked at historically, public health has been moving away from mandated impositions and moving towards reliance on voluntary compliance. And this is due to two fundamental changes. First of all, the shift from contagious disease to chronic lifestyle disease as the main problem that we face. We no longer die of cholera or the plague, we die of heart disease or cancer. These are diseases over which we have some control. They're partly linked to lifestyle choices and habits, and therefore they're hard to mandate against. It's much easier to get citizens to agree voluntarily to undertake the behavioral changes that are necessary, like smoking and drinking and eating less or exercising more and so forth. 
to shift from, from, from contagious to chronic diseases. But the other big background change that explains why public health relies more on voluntary measures these days is, of course, increasing democratization and the inability of the authorities just to decree what it is we should. Public health became a political issue in tandem with the rise of democracy. Protests against cholera measures were frequent in the 1830s. Merchants protested against quarantines and their goods. Citizens protested against being cooped up. With a smallpox uh, vaccine, violent protests broke out in cities like Leicester against the bodily violation of being inoculated. And that has, of course, increased today with civil liberties being a constant leitmotif of protests in those nations, excuse me, in those nations where compliance uh, can't be taken for granted. Compliance assumes that citizens trust their authorities to do the right thing for the right reason. It also assumes that everyone agrees on what the right thing is. New Zealanders have apparently accepted that they should give up travel for well over a year. If something as blindingly obvious as wearing masks is considered a violation of rights by a significant minority, then compliance is not something that policymakers can count on. The conclusion is twofold. Modern democracies rely ever more on their citizens to be schooled into proper conduct and not having to be forced to do what they have to do. That was the kernel of truth in the Swedish approach. The Swedes thought that they were riding the wave of public health's historical evolution when they didn't mandate actions, but instead expected citizens to undertake them voluntarily. And broadly speaking, that was true, that history is moving in that direction. But a pandemic is not broadly speaking. This was a technique that worked for chronic lifestyle diseases, but it was not the one that was best suited to an exponentially growing pandemic. So the Swedish approach was simply a category mistake. They misidentified the problem and they used the wrong tools. Pandemics are not the normal problem that postmodern democracies face any more than wars are. So we need different tools for different problems. But more broadly, what the COVID pandemic has revealed is the difficulty that multicultural democracies face, not just dealing with pandemics, but more broadly with the social control that lies at the heart of modern governance. Every society relies, of course, on some combination of official mandate or compulsion, on the one hand, and informal socialization to achieve the behavior that's required for dense metropolitan civilization. Now, insofar as modern democracies rule largely through governance, they rely increasingly on persuasion and socialization, not on diktat and command. The pandemic has, in that sense, been a salutary reminder of the formal powers states still need and still retain. The pandemic has revealed how much power the authorities had and could use, or how much they had and failed to use, depending on your advantage, of course. But either way, we were reminded that contagious disease laws are powerful instruments and that emergency legislation allows the state to do almost anything. But it has equally been a reminder that without cooperation and compliance, what a state can actually enforce on an unwilling public is very little indeed. If people want to hold illicit raves, hold illicit religious ceremonies, hold impromptu football matches, there is very little the authorities can do about it short of using tear gas and paddy wagons and mass arrests. If people won't wear masks, again, there's little that can be done. Retail shop employees who work for minimum wage cannot be expected to enforce what customers won't comply with. We're soon gonna be facing an enforcement dilemma with vaccines. The problems of not having enough supply are going to pale in comparison to those of getting the resistance to submit. In, health, in Italy and France, healthcare workers are right now resisting vaccines. And if you can't get these sorts of people to do it, then what on earth can you hope for from the population at large? Italy is now requiring healthcare workers to be vaccinated. It's the first nation to go down this route, but I suspect it's not going to be the last. The basic problem is how do you get people to take actions that require individual adherence or compliance, like masks and vaccination and distancing, if you can't really force them and you can't count on informal socialization, what's left? These are the sorts of behaviors where persuading people to comply is much more effective than coercing them. The informal behavioral socialization that is needed here is something that sits very uneasily with multicultural democracy. If assimilation has become 
an unjustified domination of one culture over another, then it's hard to see how the authorities can rely on it as they once might have relied on informal socialization to mold behavior. This was the most puzzling aspect of the Swedish approach to COVID. The Swedish policy was fundamentally incoherent because it assumed two contradictory things at the same time. It assumed, first of all, that people would do voluntarily what in other nations they had to be compelled to do. But secondly, at the same time, it also assumed that they would not do that and they would thus achieve herd immunity by spreading the disease. If the Swedish policy was to work, then people had to do on their own what they would have been required to by the authorities and other systems. That was the fundamental misunderstanding by libertarians the world over. The Swedish system didn't mean you didn't have to stay at home, didn't have to keep your distance and so forth, and could do what you wanted. It meant that you had to do this even if you weren't forced to do it by the government. The Swedish system wasn't freedom in the sense of lack of control, it was self-imposed control. In effect, it meant that to be free, we have to be our own jailers. But that turned out not to be true. The Swedes did not in fact control themselves. Sure, they stayed at home more than normal and not everyone went off to work at offices, but they didn't do enough of that. And that's why their mortality was 10 times as high as Norway and Finland where citizens were obliged by government to do what was necessary. At the same time, the Swedish approach was incoherent in its assumption of a kind of cultural homogeneity where everybody knew implicitly what the right thing to do was and where everybody was willing to do it. Now that may have been possible in the days when Sweden in fact was culturally and ethnically and religiously homogenous. But like all Western democracies, that is no longer true. Sweden is less homogenous than most other nations and in fact, it's proud of the fact. So why assume an implicit understanding among all citizens or residents on what the right behaviors are at the same time as Swedish society is clearly less unified in such respects than ever before. No other nation, not even the ones that in fact are culturally homogenous like Taiwan or South Korea gave up the possibility of enforcing behavior in the same way that the Swedes did. In that sense, the pandemic has brought to the surface the fundamental issue of social control and the style of governance that depends on it. Do we rely primarily on sticks or do we rely on carrots? to enforce behavior. Informal behavioral socialization as the primary engine of social control has been increasingly undermined in recent decades. The inability of Western democracies to assume a common substratum of cultural attitudes impedes its effect. We have in that sense all become looser societies. Pandemics like wars require drastic and immediate action. Consensus, socialization, persuasion, these are just not very useful tactics in these circumstances. The Swedes threw away the sticks and they thought they could rely on carrots alone and they prayed the price for that. You could say that the iron fist that is swaddled in the velvet glove of modern governance, that that is what the pandemic has made us realize is still necessary in epidemic circumstances like these. If you step back and look at the pandemic from a narrowly social science perspective, it has been and continues to be an extraordinary experiment. It's rarely the case that all nations simultaneously have faced the same problem have had to deal with it. What this has revealed about each national response is something I expect that we will continue picking apart for decades to come. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. So I hope Everybody um, is uh, ready to talk and discuss uh, what we heard. There's a pile of information that we are going to take apart, pick apart, and discuss uh, part by part now within the next 45 minutes. Everybody who wants to join into this discussion, and I will not take the floor for very long because I would like to have a lively discussion, please put a plus or a question, as I already see there are some, or his, his or her name into the chat, and then we will call them um, uh, into the, onto the floor as soon as possible. As long as I only see one question here, I'm going to uh, ask some of my own um, um, in, in order for all of you to think and, and prepare for the next ones. Um, we learned um, during the last half hour that states didn't react to the pandemic as one might have expected 
according to their systems or texture, if I may put it that way. Uh, even autocracies needed a certain amount um, of consensus and trust as like China, as you said, democracies needed a certain amount of decisiveness and strength if they wanted to fare well with that pandemic. And then those countries, as you say, dealt with the pandemic the best, which didn't enforce a certain behavior or ask for voluntary actions or rules alone, but those with a clear cut course and a plan and transparent decisions. My first question is, is there a winner on your list? Uh, you mean like some kind of epidemiological beauty contest? Yes. We, um, well, as I, it depends which part of the response you're talking about. So in terms of public health, yes. New Zealand well, if you put it all health. together, as you did, you know, the technological response, the political response, the social cohesion, the vaccines, is there, uh, it sounds like in your eyes, it might be China in the end, although they were the ones who brought it into the world. Um, Yes, let's, let's leave that, that, that yes. aside. Sure, if you're looking at the, the likely long-term mortality in these two years, um, China is, but on the other hand, I, I, in that sense, I don't see why China is any different from Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia. Their, their vaccine rollout is very related. You know, they're flogging their vaccine in Africa, not giving it to their own people. And we simply don't know whether it's any good. So. Um, the, you know, the, I'd say the jury is out on their medical response, um, and they did well, as you would have hoped they did um, in the public health response, but no better than other nations that didn't have to be quite as draconian as they did. Yeah. When you, you wrote that book last summer, you finished it in the fall, if I'm not mistaken. Since then, a lot has happened, and lots of things changed in the way that people accept what states ask from them. Um, your sentence, freedom means being your own jailer, was probably even true for the first months last year for, for lots of countries, not only Sweden, but uh, the number of skepticists and critics rose a lot. People in Germany, we call them Querdenker, people who don't believe in the pandemic or are not willing to uh, accept those rules. They are rising in masses and they take to the streets. Does that change your analysis over the stretch of that year? Well, it, it it doesn't change my um, not very favorable view of my fellow humans. Um, mm -hmm. These are, uh, I mean, how should we put it? Um, under every stone, out crawl something or other. And in this case, uh, Kvyadenka, you know, among those who come out of it. Um, it, it, it certainly is not surprising that as lockdowns continue, well over a year after the start of the pandemic, the people are getting pretty fed up and are looking for other solutions. It is equally the case that had more decisive lockdowns taken place for shorter and more effective times to start with, we might not be having this dilemma. Again, in that sense, you know, the Chinese, but also the for you know the Taiwanese and the the, the let's call them the Asian nations for lack of uh, time. Um, you know, they obviously are doing much better in the sense that their populations are not sort of bristling in the same sense because they're out and about and enjoying themselves. They can't travel uh, out of the country, at least except to New Zealand, if you're Australian and vice versa. But uh, but they're certainly living domestically much more normal lives than the rest of us. Yeah. So so I think I think the uh, the rise of the skeptics is largely a, a the result of state failure in the Western democracies. It, the rise of the skeptics does produce uh, a fear of the state of right-wing radicalism. The AfD, for example, in Germany, the right-wing uh, parties uh, are on the rise. So is uh, the, the, the failure to react properly to that pandemic combined with a political reaction, or is it not? Because if you look at uh, Israel, uh, Netanyahu didn't really win massively. Bolsonaro is not on the verge of, of being driven out of his country. Putin with his lies is still uh, well in his seat. Johnson is more popular than ever. So it, I'm not sure whether politics uh, are influenced by the pandemic or in the end they are not. I'm not quite understanding your question. Whether politics are influenced, but I mean, in some places they have been in some not, but no, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think in the midst of a pandemic, what, what, what citizens ask for is some sense of security and a sense that someone's on top of the problem and doing something about it. And in that sense, it, it, it state failure is the problem, not so much a strong um, you know, movement in one way or another. I mean, in fact, I mean, if we look at the, at least the first wave, citizens have been 
rather content with whatever their governments did, regardless of what the governments did. So the Swedes were happy with the Swedish course and the Danes were happy with the Danish course, even if they were diametrically opposed. They just wanted to think that somebody was going on. Now, I mean, do, you know, doing something was the right thing. No, there has been sort of more, I think, resistance in Sweden sort of boiling up as they begin to realize that, or as they, as they began to realize that, you know, they weren't getting, uh, this wasn't exactly a sort of a, a good solution. Um, and that's probably the case in other nations as well. You know, there's a lot of, of lockdown tiredness yeah. and sort of rebellion well, going on. What I was trying to say, sorry for being uh, uh, imprecise, is does the pandemic change electoral behavior? You mean shifts from left to right? Mm -hmm. For example, uh, a slight, very much slight shift in the U.S. to the left, and um, a very slight shift in you know, to a Tory government that was already in power in the U.K. And um, I don't know what's going to happen in Germany. Uh, I don't know. That, if so, it's pretty subtle. Okay. One last question from my side. Then I'm going to open the floor. Um, it, I've, uh, lots of experts have been discussing for months now that they expect major changes, uh, behavioral changes uh, from to come from the epidemic. You analyzed very well that many of those that we were thought would be self-understood, like less travel, um, uh, um, maybe more smarter production, other other production chains, would be would be an automatism. Obviously, it's not. Uh, is there, can you explain to us why people don't learn from a, from a big crisis like this? Well, okay, what are they supposed to learn? Always to wear masks, never to come near people. I mean, the thing about a crisis is it requires crisis behavior for a while. And then ideally one goes back to normal. Now, what the normal, the new normal is going to be, I suspect is going to be different from the old normal, because I do think we're all suffering, you know, various sorts of psychic scars. I, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not going, inside to a restaurant anytime this side of Christmas, but that's just my own sort of personal decision. And I doubt ever, that I'm ever gonna get on a New York subway um, not wearing a mask again in my life. But you know, who knows, maybe in three years, um, I, you know, I'll be reassured. I, I think we all have sort of you know, behavioral, some kind of instinctual notion of how we're gonna ease ourselves back into, nor in, into uh, normality. I'm in New York at the moment. Uh, people are acting extremely normal. It makes me nervous because I think, you know, the vaccine and the third wave are running basically neck and neck. It's very unclear which one is going to win. And uh, I wish they would have sort of put off the restaurant openings for a month myself, but, you know, I'm not making the decision. So I think we all have, you know, individual responses in that, in that sense. I think psychologically, it's going to be very interesting to see how people go back into normality. And I suspect there are many people who are not going to go back into normality. Mm -hmm. Um, Michael Seiler asked the first question. Uh, Mr. Seiler, do you want to ask, ask it yourself? Or do you want me to read it? Are you are you here? Do you want to talk to us? Probably not. Okay. Yeah. Then I'm going to read it and and uh, and. <laughs> Wait, can I just ask a question? So ask and leave. Is that appropriate etiquette? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Maybe. Well, all right. Go on. Sorry. Um, so Mr. Mr. Zayda is asking, currently in continental Europe, the two countries which are most successful at the rollout of COVID vaccination doses are Serbia and Hungary. Both countries developed in many aspects of democratization, rule of law, but backwards and receive significant capacities of Sputnik V and Sinopharm at the moment. Does cooperation with or dependency of authoritarian states or systems such as Russia or China, in your opinion, are determined by causality or just correlation? So what I'm, do you, oh, I'm not sure I understand the question. What he means is uh, Hungary and Serbia are doing quite well with the vaccines at the moment. They right. are working together with Russia and China. They are importing Russian and China Chinese right, right. vaccines. No, um, is that is that the reason is the reason that they're not clinging to European decisions uh, the reason for their su success? Well, sorry, not clinging to European decisions insofar as ordering Russian exactly. and Chinese vaccine. Yeah. Well, that strikes me a pragmatic and um, a reasonable response to a situation where they can't get what clearly they want, namely enough vaccines. Um, why not? Um, so, what are you saying? This are you criticizing the EU in the in the in the, in the same in the same sentence for a slow well, reaction? I, it, it's hard to see. It's hard to see that there's much good in the EU's vaccine rollout. I mean, it's been much too slow. 
and and uh, it, it's been it's insufficient by anybody's standards. So, if if you happen to be, have access to another source of vaccine as a national leader, why would you not take advantage of it? Now, whether or not the Russian or the Chinese vaccine is one to take advantage of, uh, that's something on which I have no opinion. But I would hope that their leaders had you know looked at the evidence or asked for the evidence on the third the third round of testing, you know, to get some sense of whether it makes any sense. Okay. Yanis Panagotidis wants to ask something. Is he or is he here, Yanis? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, I have, well, two points, I guess. Um, one of which came up um, during your the first round of discussion now. Um, the level of discontent in particular, I think is, is a very interesting topic because if you follow news reporting on the one hand, you would think that there is a very high level of discontent in countries like Germany and Austria, which are the, the two main countries that I'm sort of um, immersed in and that I'm following. But then you see um, then you see opinion polls, which show still a very high degree of, um, well, actually of agreement with government policies still. So this this, this very public discontent, the querdenka, et cetera, are still um, marginal phenomena at the end of the day. Um, and I don't see, like if you look at political numbers, I don't see the AFD, for instance, on the rise in Germany at all. Their numbers have been going down because their response to, to COVID is so incoherent. On the one hand, they say um, it's, not, it's not a problem. On the other hand, they say the government is not protecting us from it. So I think that they are actually choking on their very inconsistent, inconsistency on the issue. Um, but so that, that, that's, that's one thing. But the other thing um, is about um, your talk. And I have to apologize that um, for the last two, three minutes or so, my internet broke down. So I didn't hear... Um, the end of your talk. So maybe you said some of the things that I'm at, that I'm going to ask you now, um, which is about matters of class. You talked about culture. Um, you talked about um, compliance as a sort of um, cultural phenomenon, as a function of multiculturalism, of, of trust in society, homogeneity. But what about class? What about the extent to which people are able to comply with um, certain measures? Um, when they're not being enforced, for instance, um, at the workplace. Um, mm. And that's, that's, actually, that's actually a part of, um, and, and, and there are big discussions on this now, right now, to what extent um, it makes sense to, to, to keep talking about people, people complying or not with the rules when, um, you know, when they're forced into offices, when they have to work in factories, et cetera, where they cannot comply with certain rules or um, they're not. They're yeah. They, they're not. They're not allowed to basically. Or there are no. Um, when there are no restrictions imposed on employers, for instance, no compulsory testing, no compulsory masks, etc. And so people, especially in socially vulnerable positions, um, are 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 put um, in a very uncomfortable spot, and they do have the higher infection rate, etc. So long story short, um, what about class in all of this? Yeah, you put your finger on, on the biggest of the dirty little secrets of the pandemic, not much of a secret, right? That uh, the population is divided sort of largely half-half between those who got to stay at home and order in from restaurants and Amazon and watch Netflix and get paid even though they were doing their jobs in their pajamas and the rest who had to go out and, and be on the front lines and be exposed. And that, of course, is the, the fundamental social inequity of, of it. Now. Um, had I been dictator and able to sort of do something about this, I suppose the obvious things to mitigate the difference would have been, had something to do with, well, first of all, making sure that the people who stayed in their jobs were at least as well treated as those who were given uh, unemployment and various, you know, that benefits that sort of kept their wages going, even if they weren't w working. So, you know, any, anybody who was working on the front line should have gotten, you know, an automatic 10% wage increase or something like that. And then there's some obvious things like sufficient supplies of PPE for those people who most desperately needed. It was sort of grotesquely inadequate in the first uh, three months, at least, of the, of, of the epidemic. So you could say something similar about um, the vaccinations. I mean, if you're rolling out vaccinations and you have to pick priority groups, people on the front lines should surely have been higher than uh, you know, your average 60 year old sitting at home 
and, and, and zooming it would be, have, have been my guess. So I, I think there were a few places that did uh, you know, j jiggle the priority groups. And it, it's interesting with the vaccine rollout because there, as far as I know, there haven't been any sort of broad official attempts to homogenize the prioritization you know, various localities have done this in different ways. And um, it'd be a fascinating study to see who chose what, um, the, you know, in, in terms of who, who, who got the things first. But I would certainly have said that frontline workers should have been thought about first when it came to PPE and, and vaccines to try to mitigate this. Dennis, I assume you had another question because you said you had a few, but I would like to um, ask Anastasia Schacht first and then get back to you because there are no further questions as far as I can see so far. Anastasia, can you hear us? Yes, I do, but unfortunately, you have already asked my question. Oh. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely heartbroken about the question <laughs> about the synchronous distribution about, and the correlation between uh, the governmentality regimes and uh, rejection of uh, lockdown measures has been already asked. So I'm um, horrible. It's yes. But thank you very much for a beautiful talk. That was really, really inspiring for all of us, I suppose. Maybe, maybe the question about uh, the rejection of those rules is a very Eurocentrist question because uh, the Germans and the Austrians are fascinated by it. But I guess in other countries, yes, this are. is not a discussion at all. And, and, and maybe that is actually interesting too. Why do, why do Central European or Western Europeans uh, who, who have the chance to uh, comply to a rather soft ruling, you know, and, and still uh, live parts of their life quite well. Why do they reject uh, that friendly approach of the state as much? Mr. Baldwin, do you want to, do you want to say something about that? Why are the Germans so crazy? I'm, I'm not quite sure I've, I've understood the question. You mean, why are the Germans now, now sort of reacting, you know, kicking up a fuss? late in the in the pandemic well I, i'm not quite get it well the germans uh, are usually not good in accepting authorities um during the last uh, 60 70 years i don't like that much more much that, that at, but at the moment uh whatever the state does it's being rejected by more and more people and the discussion about a german dictatorship is on the rise and that's kind of absurd mm. when you say germans are not good at accepting authority over the last 60 or 70 years um, can I sort of ask you what you mean by that? Because you know, the funny thing is, this is what the Swedes say about themselves too. You know, uh, it's very interesting uh, to suddenly experience all these, you know, happy-go-lucky Northern Europeans, whom we, uh, you know, have long thought of as being people who are fairly well socialized into um, circumstances, you know, whose countries are tight ships run uh, in a sort of, you know, proper manner um, and not allowed, you know, fantastic amounts of leeway, other than being able to drive as fast as you want in certain parts of the autobahn and things like that. Um, I, I mean, I know there's a pose in Germany about being so anti-authoritarian, but you know, people tend to not cross the street when the light is red and stuff like that. Well, but maybe Germans tend to believe or tend to, to uh, see, them, see themselves at, at, as people who are socially, uh, they have a social conscience, nobody should be left behind. You know, we have a social democrat, a long social democratic or mm -hmm. social liberal um, tradition, uh, a, a Christian tradition, and nevertheless, uh, um, there's a there's a there's a new egotism, obviously, which is uh, becoming more and more of a problem. So here's, um, let me put a sort of counter question to you, because one of the things that struck me is the extent to which countries, with, with sticking to OECD countries now, the ones that sort of, you know, have had the least welfare state, the least social policy, the least concern, the most inegalitarian and so forth, um, you know, are also the ones where, uh, in effect, um, many people who um, were hard pressed before the pandemic have actually done economically better in the pandemic than, you know, outside the pandemic. It's, there's been a lot of downward, um, redistribution. And it has also struck me that the distribution of vaccines has been remarkably good. I was expecting, maybe I'm just a cynic, I was expecting there to be a lot more corruption and a lot more favoritism and a lot more people getting it behind the scenes and knowing the right person. There's been some, obviously, but nothing remotely like what you would expect, given that we're talking about hundreds of millions of doses. I think the OECD nations, and as far as I can see, others, all others as well, uh, but I obviously can't speak to that um, very well, have actually been pretty rule following um, and norm upholding on that 
on that front. Maybe we'll, there's still something that we'll find out and see during the next years, but we'll, we'll probably be mm. amazed anyways. Rakesh Batabyal would like to join, the, join us on the floor and talk. Rakesh. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much. I was, while listening to you, I was thinking whether India is an exception to your paradigm, whether in this, uh, such a pandemic situation, the state should be in a commanding position. Here, this was exactly the time when the democracy was thought to be the more and more socially mobilizing force against a centralizing state. And that's why a lot of democratic movements came up exactly during the pandemic. They thought the state is opaque. The state is not doing its job. It's not able to do its job because it was centralizing. It is corrupt. And therefore, it is just the opposite what your, uh, what you, your prescription would be that the state should be commanding at this kind of situation. Any comment on that? Well, I, I, I do think that the fundamental, I mean, there are two fundamental explanations for why societies did well. Either they have strong states that were able to do it, even against resistance, or they have a sufficiently strong state to take the necessary actions, plus an awful lot of willingness on the part of the citizenry to meet them halfway. So, you know, the New Zealanders didn't run around imposing unusually draconian laws in the way that the uh, Chinese did, but, you know, they didn't have to because they had a lot of buy-in. And the Chinese, the average Chinese also seems to have agreed that whatever the Chinese state was doing wasn't sort of unreasonable given the circumstances. I mean, I'm sure there would have been more protest, um, you know, had, had they not sort of, had the Chinese authorities not sort of uh, effectively complied with the kind of implicit uh, social contract that was going on. Now, the Indian case, you know, it's interesting, uh, and I, let me give you another question uh, to mix into this, because one of the ways in which the Indians have dealt with this, um, the first wave was handled not so great. Um, I mean, there was that sort of, you know, immediate and mass lockdown that then turned into a huge exodus and spread the disease throughout the countryside, and then was unrolled. But then after that, you know, India enjoyed effectively, I think to this day, has mortality and infection rates, even despite the big wave at the moment, that are like a tenth of most European countries. So there, there you know, there have been various sort of voices uh, claiming that one of the reasons, not India in particular, but you know, many third world countries, uh, many developing nations as a whole, that there is something biologically different. You know, that the the hygiene hypothesis actually may mean something in this case, and that if you don't have you know, ultra hygienic circumstances on an everyday basis that actually revs up your immune system and you do better. Now, whether this latest wave is going to sort of, you know, make hash of those arguments or not, I don't know. There's still Africa to deal with where you know, mercifully there hasn't been the kind of, uh, of pandemic wave that, that we might have feared, but you know, that's I suppose possible too. I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, the obesity connection is an interesting part of this hygiene a hypothesis, you know, that uh, the vast majority of, of uh, COVID deaths have come in nations where over half the population is uh, is overweight. You know, there's some correlation there. Demography, age, and so forth, we know about that, but that also seems very odd because, you know, you would have expected the Japanese to do much worse than they did. Um, they didn't do much of anything, uh, really, and yet, uh, and with a nation, you know, that's significantly older than most, um, didn't get hit very hard uh, either. So, in any case, I mean, government competence, whether autocratic or democratic, I think is the fundamental key to the public health response. And I suppose, I mean, equally to the vaccine response, because obviously, you know, as I say, this is the one thing that Trump got right. I mean, he made a complete and utter hash of the public health response, undermined it. I mean, went out of his way to, you know, to, to get in the way of public health responders. And yet, $18 billion, you know, stuffing it down the throats of the geese that are the pharma industry and with the product that we're now all desperate to be, to get. Okay, Martina Steer, uh, put up her hand. Uh, if you wanna join uh, the discussion, uh, it's helpful if you just write something into the chat, a plus or your name or whatever, but it's your turn, Martina. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. And actually I follow you when you argue that countries basic responses fell into I think three different categories. There are the, I think you call them targeted quarantines. And then you have the countries which opposed retreats or lockdowns. And then you have countries like Austria or Germany who are on and off 
lockdowners, I would call them. So um, I can understand that. But what was what is really fascinating um, to me is that why, um, and probably this is my ignorant Central European perspective, but um, why differed the approach to handling the coronavirus? So much even countries um, considered, at least from my perspective, so similar, like the Scandinavian countries, the Nordic countries. I mean, let's see, Sweden or Denmark both followed expert advice, but ended up with, ended up with contrasting policies. So, I mean, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. It, it is one of the great mysteries. Here's another great mystery. Uh, I have no idea what the answer, I'll, I'll give you the answer, what I think it is to Scandinavia. But the other great mystery is why did Belgium and the Netherlands, same place, same people, you know, barely a border that they can sort of enforce, although they did their best, take extremely different approaches. I mean, and with, with remarkably different outcomes too. Um, that is the, that's the article I'm waiting to read when somebody does that. But anyway, in the Scandinavian one, so it's extraordinary. So, you know, uh, Finland, Norway, De Denmark, all locked down. The Icelanders are a bit uh, separate, separate category unto themselves, but you know, they have the great advantage of being an island and being an island um, makes things uh, in many ways easier. Plus they're very small. But, so let's leave the I Icelanders out of that. So the three countries did what you would expect them to do and more or less what everybody else uh, in Europe did and their mortality and infection rates you know, were according. And the Swedes decided to just hang loose and go all sort of loosey goosey on us. Uh, and try to convince us that they're not really, you know, Prussians with Omar instead. And, 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 you know, that they're a totally different character from what we sort of expected them to be. And the, the reason largely, I think, is because a weak coalition government and a strong public health administration that claims that the government should not interfere. I, this is a bit of a myth, I think. Uh, but it is true that the government, in order to sort of actually directly intervene, has to take certain steps. They could have done it if they'd wanted to. They could have retrospectively legitimized it after the fact if they wanted to. But it was a weak government and a strong public health administration. And this public health administration, we're talking about, you know, four or five people, all of whom trained each other, all of whom were best friends, a tiny group of technocrats who, for whatever reasons, decided to go off piste in, in their own direction. And you know, never look back. And it, why Tegnell has not been reassigned to count fleas north of the north of the of the Arctic Circle years ago or months ago, I do not understand. I mean, in any other country, this man, you know, would be scrubbing the floor somewhere. It's just extraordinary to me that he's still in power. Thank you. Okay, Yanis, do you want to join in for the second time because um, you could have the floor? Well, yeah, just wanted to basically um, what I also wrote in the chat. I mean, I really wanted to counter that impression that Germans taking here as an example are going crazy because I think the numbers very much show that in their majority, they are not. In their majority, they actually want uh, harsher measures or at least more effective, effective measures. Um, so if you, if you combine those numbers that I posted in the chat, 70% are either happy with the measures as they are or want stricter measures. It's one quarter who think it's too much. Um, and I think if we sort of treat the querdenker or those who take to the streets as the voice of the people, as they like to see themselves, we're really running the risk of, um, of, of creating false political pressures, giving, the, like giving governments the impression that they have to act and a lot of the discourse, the political discourse, seems to be driven by that kind of dynamic. The idea that we have to lift restrictions at any cost because people are grumbling, because people are unhappy. Then you look at a survey like this and you see the opposite is the case. And I think this is quite remarkable that, that, that there should be such a discrepancy between, between an image that we have and what the numbers say. So I wonder if, if, if you have any, any thoughts on that. Well, it, um... It, very interesting what you say. You're saying effectively it's a kind of media focus on two, on a small group and blowing it out of proportion. And, you know, I, I think there's much to what you say. I was just called on the mat. I wrote a little thing, an opinion piece for CNN, and I off the cuff said something about millions of people protesting masks in the in the Western democracies. And the fact checkers wrote back and said, can you give us a source for millions of people? And so I, you know, I, I, I Googled around a bit. And probably if I had added up all the people mentioned in all the articles, 
he might have made a million somewhere, you know, or another. But I sort of said, yeah, okay, you're right. You know, I, millions is an exaggeration. So let's say, just say many. So, you know, CNN covered and I covered my bottom that way. Um, but I, I, I they take your point. I, I think you're, they do manage to get the spotlight and, and, and the, you know, the attention. And you're probably right that on the whole, most people, I mean, you're certainly right that most people don't agree with them, but that they're simply, we think of them as more powerful and more numerous than they really are. Okay. We still have a few minutes. Is there, are there any more questions? If not, I would ask two. No, 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 there is one. Um, no, I okay. would like to um, I put a plus, but, but only recently. But actually, okay. I, I, I don't even want to put the question. I have a different uh, suggestion for the discussion. And we just had a, we just had a panel on capitalism in East Asia. Um, and in the COVID crisis, we have had some discussion, but not a big one, about what one can learn from uh, East Asia. And here we have a colleague from Vietnam. He, he couldn't uh, join the, the last panel because there was technical trouble, but now he's with us. And so uh, from Hanoi, there's um, uh, Professor Min, also former vice rector. And I hope you can listen to me well. And I hope you don't mind me calling you up in a way. But if you would like to tell about the Vietnamese experience and what could be possibly learned from that, um, I would be interested if that if that works and if, if I'm not imposing something uh, on you. I would be really interested in that. I, I might also have a small question, but, but uh, I would rather learn from other people than posing a question. So can you, can you hear me? In, in, if you want to respond, you're still mute. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Thayer. I'm um, sorry for not uh, being able in the first part. Actually, I intended to um, participate in the first part of the so-called capitalism in East Asia. But I missed this, uh, this part. But no, OK. I, I enjoyed the second part about the COVID-19. And thank you, thank you, Professor Baldwin, for your very um, insightful uh, presentation about the COVID-19. So, um, yeah, I, I was also wondering some point, of course, for example, if we compare the Eastern, okay, the, the Eastern Asian country and the Western European country, we see it seems to be it seems to be the situation in East Asia or in Asia seem to be um, better. I don't know. I don't know. It is the so-called political or, or social country um, influence up uh, for the COVID nineteen. Here in Vietnam, I think we say that some um, chat. Vietnam could achieve some 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 success some success because of the so-called social country uh, factors. It means that uh, here in Vietnam, the government uh, provides very strong, very very hard uh, measurement to fight against uh, COVID nineteen. They consider. Uh, Mm. And the whole country turn to the situation of the war. It seems to be the uh, war like in Vietnam. The people accept it uh, on regulation from the government. They accept it as they were in the war situation. That's why, yeah, okay, the, the so called five measurement in Vietnam, five. Number one is um, mask, okay, wearing the mask. Second, no, no, no gathering in the big number of people. Number three, it is the so-called keeping the distance. Number four is the hand declaration. And number five, last but not least, is the so-called um, Disinfection, okay. Disinfection. So these five measurements are uh, informed loudly, informed widely among the people, and all people uh, follow the regulation of the government is very strictly. So positively, so far in Vietnam, 
uh, we have just only 35 cases of death, just only 35. It is very limited number in comparison to the other country. And uh, I think this, um, the political system, the government of Vietnam is very, very strong. The people have a very strong belief or a trust in the government. They follow, they did everything to follow the regulation of the government. So uh, I think it is um, Vietnam. I think the, the, the lesson is political, political will of the government and the people respect or the people uh, acceptation, accept to the government uh, decision. So it is, it is maybe something, but okay, some people claim about the so-called democracy, some people claim about uh, the so-called, the government interfere very deeply in the personal, okay, life of the people. There was no, no personal, personal, okay, freedom. <laughs> So some people claim about such kind of thing. But in, in general, the people trust the government, the people follow the government regulation. I think it's the most important thing. Thank you. It, it's interesting that you mentioned the comparison between uh, uh, the pandemic and the war as, as people in Vietnam treated. Professor Borden, you had been talking about the differences between war and pandemics in, in, at the beginning of your speech. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? They, well, I mean, I, I haven't quite, didn't quite catch the, the, the war illusion in, in the question of, of Vietnam. Um, it, it sounds to me like we basically agree that the Vietnamese population were sort of forthcoming and willing to cooperate. I do know, I mean, Vietnam has had remarkable results um, in terms of, you know, the, how low the death and the mortality rates. And there's been a lot of speculation. And I've, if, if I may, if I put this as a question to you, since you, you know a great deal more about this than I do. Um, the factors that I've come across have to do with things like closing the border to China so sort of quite firmly and quite early, um, travelers being put into various kinds of camps to keep them isolated for a certain amount of time. There's some general speculation as to whether the climate and the lack of you know, air conditioning and closed windows improve circulation. But then most intriguingly, there's this question of, of a cross-reactive immunity to some other unknown disease that you know nobody knows what is, but that may have provided uh, people in this part, not just Vietnam, but the neighboring countries as well. Uh, this may have provided some kind of immune uh, response, but this may of course be a bit like the hygiene hypothesis and, and, uh, and the subcontinental countries, um, something that, you know, it sounds good while it works, but then something may happen to you know, disprove it. So I, I'm wondering whether Vietnamese themselves talk about of cross-reactive immunity from other diseases. You want to answer yeah. to that? Min Tom, or not? Yeah, yeah I think it's, uh, the situation or the case of Vietnam is um, surprisingly. Actually, as Professor Baldwin uh, mentioned, uh, Vietnam is neighboring with China. And there is very long border between Vietnam and China, more than 1,300 kilometers. And uh, in the beginning, all people yeah, was very, very fearing that uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, win, okay, um, deeply and lastly influence on Vietnam situation. But um, I think the situation turned on when Vietnam, I think the, the policy of the government is very, uh, very strict and uh, they get the, the support or the so-called cooperation of the people. All people, all people, uh, okay, the government said, uh, COVID-19 is an, an enemy and all people are soldiers, you know? So the history of Vietnam is the history of, of the war, of the conflict. So people, okay, I think change their, their, their way of life from, from peace to war situation very, very quickly. There is no different 
between between peace and war, war and peace. So uh, I think the cooperation of the people is the most important thing. And I always said that Vietnam, okay, it is a country, the historical factor play an important resources to fight against COVID-19. So far, not, not so much people are, okay, uh, Vietnam did not get much, much uh, um, vaccine. Very, very limited number of vaccine was uh, uh, imported, was, um, okay, used in Vietnam. And um, the other point I think is, is uh, important that, um, uh, okay, Vietnam and, okay, there is okay if they if they if they found any cases of the so-called infected by the COVID-19, they immediately and sick of and sick of all okay area, region, or the whole provinces. Uh, so there is no connection. It means that they they try to find okay F F0, okay, the first people who infected and then put them in the quarantine immediately, immediately. And then they identify, okay, the, uh, the interaction between F0 and F1 and from F1 to F2. So all people from F0 to F3 should be put in the quarantine. So no, there is no connection between the people who are infected and the other people. It is the most important thing. And to the people, okay, the so-called um, policemen or so soldier involved very largely in this fighting. I think no country in the world use a lot of policemen and soldier uh, and put the, the, the country in under the situation of a war. Okay. So, it, it so is, this is a very important. rigid approach, obviously. Thank yeah. you. Nino, as I was really Gene would like to say something. Yes, if I if I may. So very short. Thank you very much. Um, and I would be follow this last um, um, discussion about warlike situation. I think I can somehow follow this uh, argument um, when I'm uh, when I'm comparing um, uh, situation in Georgia. So I think in Georgia was a similar attitude to this crisis uh, due to um, past experience. So when I talk with my parents, with my relatives or uh, friends in Georgia, um, um, very, very oft, often comes this um, kind of attitude. Come on, we have this master classes of 90s. So this uh, ethnic uh, wars and uh, civil war and this experience to be in crisis. Uh, I, I don't know how is it in, in English, uh, Ausgangssperre, this experience to have this, aus Thank it's you. not so big uh, dilemma, it's not so horrible. Um, and I think it is kind of this psychological uh, attitude and experience, um, uh, which is not so traumatic maybe. And, um, if I, if I can, what we have uh, in case of Georgia, very interesting, um, we have no trust in government, but it was really huge trust in medicals, medicine, as all the states, so doctors. And uh, people were, were, were really uh, hearing and uh, try to follow what the uh, medicians uh, say, not government. So the distrust uh, in government is very huge, but uh, they follow this uh, all things what uh, um, a doctor said or tried. And uh, um, as I said, um, this feeling was there. We are experienced. We know how to deal with crisis. Uh, we are alone with this uh, um, and uh, we can only really on ourselves, on our relatives or neighbors and it's not state there who cares. Uh, and this, this was kind of this war-like situation that I can somehow compare what Professor Min says in this case. So the organization from below and uh, taking initiative then from below in this case. Thank you. Thank very you very much, Nino, for that input.
we're coming to an end now. We're closing uh, closing down <laughs> soon. I would like to ask one last question, if that, if I may, uh, to Professor Baldwin, uh, because you finish your book, which is the basis of this discussion, um, with one with uh, with the sentence of in the last chapter you write, the solution has to be global or not at all. Nevertheless, we're just at the start. It seems to me of a discussion about a just division of vaccines around the world. You know, the global division of vaccines is a very big topic and it doesn't uh, make me very optimistic because uh, millions and, and millions and millions of people haven't, haven't been vaccinated. The third wave is coming, mutations are coming. So um, would you, what do you think about the, the global aspect of the vaccine topic and will we, will, will we, will we ever manage to do that justly? It's more a question for a medical person, but I, I certainly share your intuition that there's a grotesque unfairness in the way it's being rolled out. Obviously, political necessity requires those nations in the first world that develop the vaccines to, to give them to their own citizens first. I think it would be politically impossible for them to do otherwise. But of course, insofar as many people remain unvaccinated, the vast majority, and insofar as mutations spread, that of course, you, you know, we're back to square one, or we need to sort of keep exactly. running in place. Geopolitically, it's interesting what the Chinese and the Russians seem to be doing, um, you know, making some geopolitical hay out of this. And in a sense, uh, one can only wish them the best, because if the West isn't going to do it, why should they not pick up the slack? The odd thing in their cases is, is what are they doing about their own citizens? It's all well and good to be vaccinating people in the developing nation, but you still have a problem at home. And it's not as though they have, you know, millions of spare doses um, lying around. So uh, this is the elephant in the corner, and there's no in the room. There's no question. Uh, we, we simply don't know. It, it may be that by not vaccinating everyone one time first before then going back, that uh, you know we just constantly have to vaccinate and revaccinate over and over again, and we'll be living with this for decades. Yeah. So we may exactly we, we may have a permanent fourth wave. <laughs> so on this happy note, thank you everybody for for joining in, for listening, for talking, for learning. Professor Baldwin, thank you very much for that interesting talk, and I wish everybody a really wonderful and 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 uh, joyful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.